Okay, welcome aboard to live Q&A number 51. This is the part of the show where I sit here and wait for the clock in the other room to finish tolling the numbers, letting me know that it is, you know, 12 o'clock noon out here. I would have to pick this time and not pick, oh, I don't know, say one, so I didn't have to wait on the ding-dong clock on the wall to finish the thing. And then when it's finally finished, tolling the numbers, and we let all the notifications go out, I can come over here, click a button, and say, Hey, y'all, happy Sunday to ya. Hope everything is going well. Hope uh, everyone's doing okay today. Maybe you've had a little bit of shop time. Maybe you haven't. Don't know. But uh, hope everyone's doing well. We're doing all fine here at uh, Lindsay Central. <laughs> and uh, just kind of plugging away, taking it day by day. The COVID thing just will not go away. So a lot of good fun events have been canceled. But, you know, what are you going to do? You, you take it one day at a time. So let's take a look out here, see who's with us today. We have Steve Late. How you doing today? Ice Cream 62 checking in from Italy. That still freaks me out, man, that people that far away could be, you know, checking in with me and interacting and things like that. I'm 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 old school. I remember the day where if you wanted to communicate with somebody in Italy, you had to know their phone number and call them or let them call you, or you had to know their address and send them a letter via ground mail. And um, so this instant communication with people all over the world that you don't even really know is just still, there's a little bit of voodoo in there to me. <laughs> so let's see, Richard Poulin checking in. How are you doing today? Uh 34C, Steve? Wow. Yeah, we've we've had quite a bit of that around here, too. Steve Nealon from Harneal Media checking in with us. Hope things are going good for you down there in the south. And notice I made that word south two syllables. That's how it is, south. Uh, I've mentioned it before. I'm going to continue to mention it, that uh, there is a link in the description of this live stream to a GoFundMe, it's called Makers Helping Makers, and that is to benefit Steve Nealon, uh, who sponsors Mark Lindsay CNC and is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, he had some major medical issues, and um, this is just to help him and his lovely wife Pam, who is the important one of the family, as we all know, help them kind of cover some of these big, huge medical expenses that come with uh, six-digit price tags. So if you can help out, I would consider it a personal favor, and I would appreciate it if you would click that link and uh, do what you can. And even if you can't, um, please click that link and then share it on your social media so we can get it in front of uh, as many eyes as possible. And I would appreciate that and consider that a personal favor. Thank you very much for Everything for those of you who have contributed, I really do appreciate it. Let's see, Jeff Rozak is in here at the uh, excuse me, sir, but this is the non gloating section. He's putting the last bolts in his second new CNC today, and uh, it appears to be an Axiom Pro. Oh man, talk about sitting in the non gloating section. Uh, let's see, Dale Francis checking in from Utah, hoping you're making progress on your new shop. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, I.L. Peleg checking in from Israel. And let's see, Donnie L. Um, let's see, we have, let's go back up here. It kind of jumped on me. Uh, Steve Thomas from Arkansas. I had some relatives in Arkansas. They have all since left the state. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Um, Michael Bell, Mervin over at Poppy's Woodshed. 
Mike Smith from sunny central Florida. Once again, someone who likes to brag, uh, Jim Pell. Hope you got my email there, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob Sandstrom, Jonathan W, the man, the myth, the legend. If Jonathan, if you're not subscribed to Jonathan, number one, you're just wrong. Okay. If he can't fix it, it ain't broke. And if he can't fix it, he just make a new one and he don't care what it is. And that's what I love about his channel. If you like rusty metal becoming works of art, he's your guy. He'll build a car out of anything. I'm, I'm, I, I got to tell you, Jonathan, I fell down a rabbit hole the other day of looking at pictures of people taking those big true value wheelbarrows and turning them into go-kart bodies that look like tea buckets. And I, I instantly thought of you. I thought, you know, Jonathan could make a frame for his grandson and make one of those things look absolutely glorious. So, you know, just throwing it out there, Jonathan. No pressure. Just throwing it out there. Let's see. Jeff from Woody Wan in Connecticut. Six days on generator. Man, I thought the whole state of Connecticut was back up and running yet. Okay. Kevin Ells from South Africa. Greg, the snow crusher. Get my leak fixed. Um, more on that pretty soon. <laughs> Jameson. Howdy doing today. Lee Major from North Carolina. I don't know if you pronounce that Major or Mager, but I enjoyed your work uh, in the Big Valley, Six Million Dollar Man and The Fall Guy. So let's see, Pierce Day, checking in from Kansas. I'm a beast? No, you're a beast. You're a beast. I do the easy part. I just tell everybody else what to do. Y'all are the ones that do the work. Let's see, Robert, where'd it go? Everything jumped. Rob Lemke from Vancouver Island, just up the coast from me a little ways. Let's see, Jeff from Arizona, might stay under 110. Time to bust out the winter coat. Uh, let's see. John Sautier from Southeast Wisconsin. Let's see. Uh, Dave Matthews. How you doing, Dave? Troy F. Ben. We're going to try this, Ben. Is it Scheuer or Shower? Well, I've never been very good at names, but I give it my best shot. Uh, let's see, uh, Javi's Wood Shop, Havasaurus checking in from, I don't know if you're in Central Florida today or sub, South Florida, but wherever you are, hope it's a good one for you. Um, uh, Malcolm Temporal from Cyprus, and you think my clock is slow? My, my friend, my clock has been slow for 30 years, and there's nothing I can do about it. Eli Fuentes down in California, Ronald Ledger in Bedford, way down under. Uh, Mohan Marawala from India. And Michael Johnston checking in from Scotland. Let's see, Rob Lemke. Uh, I already mentioned Rob, but welcome again anyway. Jim Hester in Kentucky. Let's see, Mike Rickard. Lots of folks joining in. I'm almost caught up. Neil's Hobby HQ. Uh, Jonathan's channel, I all is Jonathan W, just as you see on the screen. And he is the man, uh, William Starkey, uh, Jameson's letting us know he's from, uh, St. Louis, David Dietrich and Papa Rod from Columbus, Georgia. Okay. I think I'm finally caught up unless somebody else new joins in. Welcome aboard, y'all, and thank you for spending, well, good grief, I'm eight minutes in, and, uh, okay, it is think of your shoe and add ER to say it, sure, okay, cool, all right, yeah, uh, Javi's playing with the closed caption, if you, and now you see, welcome to my life, that's what I spent most of uh, my Saturday doing is taking those closed captions that um, YouTube generates automatically and then going back into and editing them. And it's something I'm here to tell you right. 
<laughs> okay, Jacques Pettit victory from Applegate, Oregon. That is not only right down the road, we could almost throw rocks at each other from uh, from our living rooms. Uh, I have a close connection with Applegate. My great-grandfather and my father were born just right up the road from you in Provolt. That's where the original homestead is uh, here in Southern Oregon, out by Murphy. And I know you know where that is. Everybody else in the world is going, what? Okay. Well, so anyway, you know what? Shoot me an email. Get a hold of me uh, on the Contact Us page on my website, marklindsaycnc.com, sponsored by Harneal Media. And uh, maybe we'll go get some coffee or hoot and holler a little bit. So... Today, I did another answer your YouTube questions, or your YouTube, your Vectorit questions, and uh, that has come in from, what I do is over the course of a week, I take the questions I'm getting in via email or what I'm seeing people post in uh, some of the Facebook CNC groups. And I've had a couple of people PM me and I've seen a few posts about the uh, cleaning up a image after a bitmap trace and specifically all those little rectangles. Um, the, the, and I fussed over this for about a week looking for the right image to use as a uh, example and finally came up with that Volkswagen that I used back in uh, part 14 because it's easier and easier nowadays to find vector drawings that will eliminate a lot of that. And if you, even if you can find a clean PNG file with a transparent background, it'll eliminate a lot of uh, those little artifacts. So it, it, I have, <laughs> I have traced some images that have been so loaded with those little things, it wasn't even funny. Uh, a couple years ago, I did a Maker's Rock uh, entry, in which I used an album cover from a Frank Zappa album. And we, if, for those of you who don't know, Maker's Rock is a annual event where makers just pick out an album cover and we create that album cover in the medium we like. Some people paint, some people, uh, like me, cut them out. I V-carved a Frank Zappa album cover, and it was, uh, it had his mustache, and uh, his little soul patch was part of the album cover. And when I traced that image, let me go back and regroup here, on the real album, the mustache and soul patch were fake fur. So that's what I did. I V carved those areas out and I cut out fake fur and glued them in and trimmed it all up and everything. But tracing that album cover was an adventure because I had to go in where V carve at that time it was V carve pro. I think I was on 8.5 by that time. It tried to trace every individual hair of that mustache and that soul patch. And I had to go in and clean that whole thing up. And you want to talk about a nightmare. That took a lot of cleaning up. So <laughs> finally got it. But um, images like that, if you adjust that noise filter and just keep going back and forth. I didn't show it in the video, but sometimes uh, fading the image a little bit or bringing up the fade level to where there's a little bit more contrast, sometimes that'll help as well. But mainly just adjusting that noise filter will help you get rid of a lot of those little artifacts where it's trying to get as much detail as it can. And that can save hours because when I was just starting out, I didn't realize what that noise filter did. And you could, sp you could literally spend 8, 10, 12 hours sitting there just going through and deleting those little uh, rectangles that are just not necessary. So, and the other one was the um, 
on the separate last pass, I had a discussion via PM with somebody talking about trying to use that separate last pass. Was there a way to strip that last pass G code out of the, uh, make that a separate tool path? And if you know what you're doing with G code, you can go in and separate things, but it really isn't necessary. Uh, I was trying to show him how it worked, the way it worked, and what those separate tool paths actually did and how the bit positioned itself. Um, I use ten thousandths of an inch because, as I say, just about every bit I have is capable of trimming off ten thousandths of an inch of three-quarter inch material without any deflection or chatter or anything like that. Now, that's just a little less than a quarter of a millimeter. So you folks who use the metric know we're talking about just removing an infinitesimal amount. So just about any bit that has a cutting length long enough to go through three-quarter inch material in one pass can do it. Uh, some can't, and you do have to be careful with that. And I mentioned that in my first tutorial about the separate last pass. Uh, you have to be careful that you make sure that your bit's cutting length is at least, you're better, you're better off if it's more than the thickness of your material, but it's got to be at least the thickness of your material. So... Um, I, I have two one eighth inch bits that I could not use to cut through three quarter inch material with a separate last pass. So I just have to be careful which one I get. Um, okay, let's get in here and see some questions. If anybody has any questions at all about today's video or anything else, um, just please go ahead and throw them in the, in the chat here and we'll get to it. I saw one up here early real early okay from donnie l what would be your bit recommendation for carving christmas ornaments that have a lot of small detail okay are you talking about 3d ornaments or just 2d shapes like a snowflake or something like that and what's the thickness of your material uh you can get as small as you want but uh Personally, if I were going to do something like snowflakes or angels or something like that, it would depend on the radius, the inside radius of any inside corners you have. I tend to cut out a lot of things with quarter inch end mill, but I do go down to eighth inch end mill. End mill. Um, just depending upon the inside radius. If I've got to touch, cut some real tight radius then I'll go ahead and go with an eighth inch end mill. But again, you have to be careful about the thickness of your material because most eighth inch bits have like a uh, five eighths of an inch cutting capacity. Some of them will go up to one inch, but uh, you have to be careful about that. Uh, so it just depends on what I'm doing. And for 3D carving, I bounce back and forth between a one eighth inch tapered ball nose and a 1 16th inch tapered ball nose. Uh, I haven't really found anything where I needed to go below that. Smaller than that, I mean. So, I hope that answers the question. Let's see. Charles Brown wants to know which quarter inch end mill is best for hogging out material for 3D routing. End mill or ball nose before doing the finish with a 1 8 inch ball nose. Um... I tend to use a quarter inch end mill, but again, it's going to depend on the level of detail. A quarter inch end mill will only, the roughing tool path will only allow it to get down into areas where it will fit. Uh, and I use a machining allowance of about 30 thousandths of an inch, meaning that uh, the roughing tool path Anywhere the quarter inch end mill can get down in there, it's going to stay 30 thousandths of an inch away from the actual 3D surface. 
and I let the ball nose come in and clean all that out. The main reason for the roughing pass is to hog away the material at a uh, faster rate to allow the, uh, the tapered ball nose to be able to run a little faster and uh, clear away that, uh, that material without any problems. It just It's easier on the bit if you do a roughing tool path. Now, a lot of people that have strong, firm, rigid machines, uh, especially the bigger industrial machines, they don't even bother with a uh, roughing tool path. But you're also talking about people who can move at 300 inches and 400 inches per minute. Um, and most home hobby machines are just not capable of doing that. So I always do a roughing pass before I do a, uh, a finish pass. So um, I have used ball nose bits for hogging out the material in the past. But I find that it's kind of a wasted effort. The, uh, the straight, standard flat end mill works real well. And it's actually a little bit faster than the ball nose. So, let's see. Um, I hope that answers that question. Sorry. I see Steve posted a uh, uh, link to the video on my Maker's Rock album cover. I will put a link to that down in the description of this video. So let me make a note. Uh, just in case you wanted to see it. Uh, like I said, Maker's Rock is a fun event. You pick out the album that you want to recreate the cover of. And make it as big as you'd like. And then the thing is to give it away after the fact. You know, you get it made, you do a couple of videos, and then you give it away. You have a drawing. And it's a lot of fun. I haven't been able to participate in the last couple of years because I've simply been too busy. But uh, I may be able to join in this year. We'll see. So, uh, Jim Pell wants to know, does a downcut spiral bit improve the edges on the last pass? Okay. It can, it just depends on a number of things. Um, it, like most things to do with CNC, the answer is it depends. A, the advantage of a down cut bit is it slices the wood fibers in a downward motion. So the top surface of the material is nice and clean. The bottom surface, however, is probably going to have chip out. If you can um, try a compression bit. A compression bit will give you a good surface top and bottom because it's up cut on the bottom and down cut at the top. And each compression bit's a little bit different. Um, some home hobby machines can't handle a uh, compression bit because on your initial entry, your initial plunge into the material, you have to be able to plunge down into the material and move, uh, cut your uh, pass depth, has to be deeper than that upcut portion of the bit. So if that upcut portion of the bit is a quarter inch tall, for example, your machine has to be able to plunge down deeper than that quarter inch and use that as a pass depth. So you may have to adjust your feeds and speeds. But a, a down cut bit will give you a clean top surface, but a chipped out kind of raggedy bottom surface. And an up cut bit will give you a clean bottom surface, but um, kind of a raggedy chipped out top surface. So it's a trade off. If I need, if I absolutely, I don't have any compression bits. So if I absolutely have to have a uh, clean top surface and uh, bottom surface both, I run half the tool pass with a down cut, shut off, um, do a tool change, and then finish it up with an up cut. So, you know, there are options. It just depends. So, okay, let's see. I hope that answered your questions. 
Michael Johnston said, I went down to a one millimeter end mill with a one eight shank. They get fragile down at that size. Yes, they do. Um, I have a 0.8 end mill that came as part of a set that I'm scared to use. Don't be. My smallest bit was 23 thousandths of an inch. Let me do a little checking here and see what that is. Uh, 0.023 inches in millimeters. That is, well, that's half a millimeter. Hmm. 23 thousandths of an inch is half of a millimeter. Okay. All right. Uh, that surprises me. I thought it was smaller than that. And I was taking it out of the little container like this. And I took it out and went, oh, neat, and promptly dropped it. And it tested the uh, strength of my um, concrete floor and lost. It shattered into three pieces. I found two. And... Um, you know, what can I say? It never saw a piece of material. I was just taken out of the box and dropped it. But the, um, your 0.8 millimeter M mill, just know that you have to run slow speeds and very shallow depth of cut. The rule of thumb is half the bit's diameter is your pass depth. And then play with it in, um, play with it with the feeds and speeds in scrap. Uh, just be careful. Now, there is a gentleman by the name of John. He's down in Australia. He runs a website and YouTube channel called Labels Extreme. And he's my hero. I want to grow up to be just like him when it comes to inlays. He does a lot of mother of pearl inlays for guitar fretboards and guitar headstocks. He has a video on his channel. I will link his channel in the description of this video. And he goes down all the way to... Well, see, I know he uses quarter millimeter bits, and I think he goes down to smaller. But when he's cutting through Mother of Pearl for an inlay... He will be down into the four, five inches per minute speed, feed rates, and a very, very tiny depth of cut. And uh, that's simply because they heat up and they will break. So um, I'll, I'll link John's YouTube channel. The man is just an absolute artist. He did uh, a guitar. It was a uh, Telecaster style guitar. The whole top of the guitar, the fretboard, the headstock, everything was ebony. And he did a, I believe he said it was a, he did white mother of pearl inlays on the body, the headstock, and the fretboard. And I think he said the fretboard alone was 96 pieces. All of the fret markers, the big scroll on the 12th fret, the whole body, the whole top of the guitar, it's absolutely glorious. And uh, he's just an artist. Like I said, I want to be just like him when I grow up. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's see. But yes, um, they do get fragile down at that size. Let's see uh jacques pettit victory says did you stop chat entries no i did not but you can only go 200 characters if you're typing out a chat if you're over 200 characters it won't let you post it okay let's see uh debbie di trapani hi mark could you show how to change to a quick call it for a quick change bit at sub point I have arthritis bad in my hands and the quick change, quick bit change out would help. Um, if you are talking about something like the muscle chuck, I have a muscle chuck and I am very, very hesitant to recommend it. 
for CNC for one reason and one reason only. I tried it on my CNC router because I thought this was really going to be something great. But no matter how tight I tightened it down, if I was using a down cut bit, it would pull that down cut, the down cut action of the bit would pull it out of that muscle chuck. And I've got a piece of, uh, let's see, where is it? Here it is right here. I have a piece of lace wood that uh, shows what I'm talking about. You can see this I was carving with the muscle chuck, and you can see that. Where'd it go? Right there, that nice big uh, gouge right there. It uh, started pulling, if you can follow the edge around, started pulling it right out. So I took the muscle chuck off, I put it on my router table, and uh, it works great for my router table, but I'm very hesitant to uh, put it on my CNC again, at least if I'm using a um, down cut spiral. So um, as far as other quick change, um, I don't know if you're using a router or if you're using a spindle. The ER collets are generally fairly easy to change you will have to do you will have to use two wrenches sometimes it just depends um, but I'm I'm real hesitant to recommend that muscle chuck now a lot of people use them and a lot of people love them um, in fact hobbies just now, um, Javi's just now commented, I must have gotten a defective muscle chuck. I swear by all five of mine and highly recommend them. You know, um, I tend to use the down cut spiral a lot. And I, after that, I really did try it. Now, the only reason I wasn't upset about that piece of lace wood is because my hardwood supplier got a large load of lace wood in and he had it marked way way down that was a bunch of leftover pieces and um it, it like i said it so i had another piece to use for the project but like i said that down cut bit it just started pulling that that bit down and i just didn't catch it fast enough and when it lifted up to move over to the next piece it you saw what it did. And I, of course, I was standing right there. So I hit the panic button and lifted it out of there. And it pulled that bit out of that uh, collet in the muscle chuck about a half inch. So, you know, I see Javi saying a down cut spiral should actually push up in if loose. No, what I'm getting at is, is the downward cut pulled the the bit out so i don't know maybe i just got a bad one but um i put it on my router table and it's perfect for that i love it router tables are notoriously uh difficult to get in and use two wrenches on to change anyway so the muscle chuck on the router table is perfect so uh, let's see now we have a couple of other uh, let's see. Charles Brown says, since one eighth finish ball nose uses one tenth the width for 3D, can I run it 200 to 400 inches per minute? About, uh, if, if you're, if you're running an industrial machine, you have an AXYZ full table CNC with a tool changer. About all I can say is try it on some scrap. You know, um, at the end of the day, that's a one eighth inch bit. Yes, I know it's a tapered ball nose, but at the end of the day, it's an eighth inch bit. Um, try it at 200. What I do is I find a pretty conservative starting point. Most of my starting points are around 50 to 60 inches per minute. And the minute it starts cutting, I start bumping up that feed rate. And you can tell, you, you, you develop your ear, you can tell when a bit is struggling 
or when a router or spindle is struggling, you can tell by the sound. If you're getting any chatter or vibration, or it sounds like the bit is struggling, back it down a little bit. And then take note of that feed rate. Um, each piece of wood is a little bit different, but um, it's... I, I can generally guess at what I'm going to be running when I'm cutting maple versus cherry versus something like lace wood or um, mahogany or something like that. But I take copious notes and I don't rely on this memory. I have nothing but checklists out there. I'm completely and totally supported by checklists. I learned that a long time ago. The first time you hit cycle start on your control computer, then look up and see that the router bit isn't spinning. You'll know what I mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, as far as speeding up 3D carvings, just know 3D carvings take time. When you're looking at that eighth inch ball nose and you're using a step over of 10%, that's, it's only stepping over a few thousandths of an inch every pass it makes. And if you're cutting something 10 inches in diameter, take an eighth of an inch and divide that by 10. That's how much that bit is stepping over. That's how you get that good detail. But even at 100 inches per minute, also remember something. Let me show you something here. I'm going to bring up a spire. Um, and I'll do a... Screen share, make sure I'm sharing, and come on, find the right screen. There I am. Okay, let me close that and uncheck these. Now, if I am in my, let's see, what was I going to do? I forgot what I was going to do now. Let me go ahead and look at my bits here. Um, I'm running this at a, f uh, that's what I was going to do. I'm running this particular bit. And like I say, I start conservative. I have a feed rate of 50 inches per minute listed here. Okay. And my step over is 8%. That's five thousandths of an inch that that is stepping over each pass. Okay. Now. My feed rate is set at 50 inches per minute, but on a 3D carve, remember the CNC always moves at the speed of the slowest axis. On a 3D carve, the Z is in almost constant motion. You'll see my plunge rate is at 25. The CNC is going to move at the speed of the slowest axis. So I can set this to 100 inches per minute all I want. If my plunge rate is set at 25, that's as fast as it's going to go. So if you want to speed up a 3D carve, and like I say all the time, experiment in scrap. If you want to speed up a 3D carve, it's adjust the feed rate and the plunge rate. Now, I have my, I set my plunge rate to half of my feed rate, just as a general rule of thumb. But I know a lot of people who have their plunge rate set at the same as their feed rate. Some bits can handle that. Some bits can't. Uh, this particular bit, 16th inch tapered ball nose, it probably could handle it. I don't know that though. So what I'll do, because I know a 3D carve is going to run at the speed of the slowest axis... Uh, I keep this at 25 and then I start adjusting up from there when I get outside on the machine and it actually starts cutting. But if you have a machine that can handle it or a bit that can handle it, if this was a 1 8 inch bit, I would probably set my plunge rate to be the same as my uh, feed rate. In fact, let me look and see what I have. My tapered, my 1 8 tapered ball nose. Yeah, I, now I have it set, the plunge rate set for half as well. So um, if you're looking to speed up 3D carves, that's the biggest single boost you can give it is adjusting your plunge rate a little bit faster. Uh, because again, the machine's going to work at the speed of the slowest axis. So I hope that helps you out. 
Um, let me go back here to V to Aspire real quick um, because I forgot there was a question earlier about the. Um, let me turn both of these on. There was a question I got in on the YouTube comments about the inside circle being cut and the outside of the circle being cut. The person noticed that on the inside cuts, it's cutting counterclockwise. And on the outside cuts, it's counting clockwise. And he wanted to know, did I do that? Or is that something that's built into the machine? Or the software, rather. That's built into the software. If I go into the inside profile, you'll see that I'm using a climb cut. A climb cut on an inside profile will, will move counterclockwise. And on an outside profile, a climb cut will move clockwise. And that is just the software knowing which edge of the bit is going to do the cutting, be it the inside edge or the outside edge, as you're looking down from the top. So that's automatic. And, you know, I learned that from uh, working with just a standard router table as a... Uh, just as a, I won't say a kid, but fairly young. So, alrighty, let's see now if we have any other question here. Okay, Jacques wants to know, a few live Q&As ago, you mentioned enthusiasm about thread milling. Please share what bit type sizes you bought and where. Haven't seen any info that guide sizes, etc., for different purposes. I haven't been able to get out to the shop and actually cut anything. I've got my first thread milling bit. I'm hesitant to recommend it because I haven't cut anything with it yet. I will go ahead and link this bit. It's a uh, magnate bit. I'll put a uh, eBay link in the uh, description of this video, video. Set that over here on top of my notes so I know to do it. But uh, I hesitate to recommend it mainly because of the length of the bit. Now, if you look at the overall length of this bit, it's not very long to begin with. And you figure this much of it is going to be in the collet. So that doesn't give you a whole heck of a lot of space for threading. You may be able to do a three quarter inch piece of stock with this. You may not. I don't know. So uh, that's why I hesitate to recommend it. I haven't tried it yet. Um, Magnate is, uh, makes good quality bits. So I, I don't have any um, I don't have any beef with Magnate. I just have a personal there's a personal little thing going on with that bit. I thought it was going to be a little bit longer. So I hesitate to uh, recommend it, but I will put a link to it down in the description of this video. Okay, let's see what we have here. A uh, ba 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 ba. Um, uh, let's see, Oregon Batman. Holy cow! For those of you who remember. If you talk to, if you talk to, if you go back, oh, I don't know, one of my first few live Q&As, I recommended Al's channel. Al is the Oregon Batman who just uh, commented. Um, he started, he was just underway with the teardrop trailer build, and I recommended his channel. I'll put a link in the description of this video, too. So you got another free plug there, Al. He's just about done. I mean, he, he put the safety chains on it in his last video just a couple of days ago. Took it down and got it weighed. It came right in at about 1,000 pounds without the battery in it. And where are you getting a 70-pound, 70, 70 or 80-pound battery, Al? What are you putting in that puppy? <laughs> are you trying to jumpstart semis in the parking lot for extra cash? Um, this teardrop came out gorgeous and i'm talking gorgeous i'm i'm still waiting for you to pull off that film off of the uh 
off of the, uh, gosh, uh, the, I've lost the name. I can't think of what it's, Phylon. I'm waiting for you to pull that off the Phylon because I'll be honest, the tape on that hatch bugs me. But anyway, I, I can't wait for the full reveal and you can bet I'm going to uh, promote the heck out of it. So, uh, Oregon Batman, check him out, especially if you like homemade trailers. The Teardrop is not his first trailer. He's built a couple, and his build series are very detailed. He uh, is very good at what he does. I highly recommend it. So, uh, let's see. What's the length of cut on that? Uh, the cutting length is 3 eighths of an inch. Uh, cutting diameter is 5 eighths of an inch. Cutting length of cut is 3 eighths of an inch. So, okay. Um... Uh, Otar Melivold, um, and if I butchered your name, I apologize. Holy cow, 45 minutes. I've got to end this pretty quick. Um, I'm considering buying a Millwright CNC Mega 5. Do you have any thought about their machines? Only this. I am not a fan of drive belts, and the Mega 5 does not use drive belts. That is a major bonus. Lead screw and ball screw don't stretch you don't have to keep adjusting the tension um from everything else in their class i think if i were starting over again and weren't building my own machine i would i would put that head and heads head and shoulders above quite a few of them out there and i'm not going to mention any names i think you know the ones i mean i'm not a fan of drive belts uh, they stretch, they go out of adjustment, they need to be tightened, adjusted, and played with all the time. Ball screws, lead screws do not do that. So um, I've not heard anything good, bad, or indifferent, but um, I don't see a downside to it. That's just my personal opinion. Now, I know nothing about the company. I don't know what their support is like. I don't know anything about that. But just the bare bones mechanics of the machine, the fact that there are no dry belts, that's a plus for me. So, uh, Dave Matthew said the magnate bit worked well for me. You need to carefully measure to set it up in the tool database. Okay, thank you for that tip, Dave. Um, let's see, uh, SimPilot 2018, is there a way to convert a photo to carve in 3D? There are lots of ways. Uh, I just put together a WorkBee system and using vCarve. Not in vCarve. vCarve does not create or edit 3D files. It will run a 3D file. You can import a 3D file into vCarve. But you cannot create or edit 3D, um, 3D models in vCarve. You have to have a Spire for that. Having said that, check into the Photo vCarve toolpath. Uh, follow the Vectric tutorials. I have not done one yet, so I can't. Uh, I can't comment on that. But um, if you just put together a WorkBee system, you might want to get a few projects under your belt first so you can learn your machine, learn its capabilities, learn your tools, learn their capabilities, and um, then move on to uh, uh, something like this. This is an, uh, a photo VCarve is an advanced project. So get a few projects under your belt. You will be less likely to want to take a hammer to the machine if you do. And uh, so, other than that, I have not done any videos on creating 3D uh, models out of photos or anything like that, mainly because I'm still learning myself. And I have a very deep philo philosophical problem with presuming to try to teach somebody something I'm only learning how to do myself. I got to get a few more under my belt before I try to teach anything. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put an end to this one. We'll wrap this up. I got to remember to put a link to the Frank Zappa album cover, the uh, Labels Extreme YouTube channel, and the eBay link to the Magnate bit. 
Um, one last question from Steve Thomas. If you're cutting through quarter inch birch to do a monogram, what bit would you use to get a smooth top and bottom? Uh, because I don't have a compression bit and that may be a little bit touch and go anyway on quarter inch birch. I would probably do a one eighth inch cut with a down cut bit to start one eighth inch deep, then finish it up with an up cut bit. So you have a tool change in there, reset your Z zero, go for the gusto. If the back has to be as pretty as the front, that's what I would do. Experiment on some scrap. So I'm going to go ahead and end this been almost an hour. Holy cow. So, um, I want to say thank you to a few, few folks. I've already sent out emails who have made more than generous donations to, uh, to support the site. Y'all may or may not know it, but you are directly, um, funding the electrical install on the shop shed. I promised an update on the shop shed. It's kind of gone a little bit, maybe on hold, um, doing some work, getting ready to hook up the electrical and found a major plumbing leak. So everything went on hold. The plumbers are due out, uh, this week. And, uh, once that's fixed and I finish paying that bill, we can carry on from there, but I kind of had to stop on the shop shed right now until the plumbing issues are fixed. Cause I don't know how much that's going to go. Um, if it goes too high, I may have to put things on hold, but, uh, I had, uh, a few very generous people send in donations and I really do appreciate that. I don't mention it often. If you'd like to support the channel and, uh, would like to fund some of the shop shed, look in the description of this video. There are links down close to the bottom where you can do so. But if you're really thinking about a donation, um, hit that uh, GoFundMe for Steve Nealon's at Harneal Media uh, to help them take care of daily expenses while he cannot bring in an income. And uh, I would prefer that. But so all that being said, I want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday with me. This is me saying bye, y'all. Now go out and do something cool. Y'all take care.